Hi, it's Mike again. I want to take a couple minutes and talk to you about the history of die making and the evolution of envelopes, at least how I see it or understand it. About 10 years ago, I was fortunate enough to do some work up in the Massachusetts area. I stopped in the Crane Museum. And if you've got time, I can't recommend it enough. It was really cool. Because that's where the first envelopes, as far as I know, were made. And they made them by hand. There was no die cutting. At that point, they took screens, put wood slats to form a diagonal seam envelope, and then they had hundreds, of, maybe thousands of them, and hundreds of women that would dip it in the paper pulp and take it out, put it on a shelf, let it dry for a couple days, peel it out between the wood, hand fold it, and you had an envelope. And it, it worked for a while, but then in 1853, the first folding machine was patented in the U.S. And then it was game on. You know, that was the game changer because now things, it's production, you know. And 165 years later, we're still talking about production. So when that happened, really the only ones who were die cutting were the shoe industry. And they use these dies called clicker dies. And I hate the things. And we still make them. And I hate them because they're light. They're thin, they're thin walls, they're just everything I don't like in, in life. They're just flimsy. But they, for the leather, they're cutting one piece at a time, it works. So they did that for about five, six years. And in 1859, there was a young blacksmith by the name of A.M. Howe. And he was just starting out. He opened up a, a blacksmith shop, turned it into a dye shop. And he did it for about 40 years. He was the first die maker in the United States. And this is one of his original dies. It's the oldest die I've got. And what was really cool is when he sold his company in like the mid 1890s, 95, 96, he sold it to a company named J.J. Adams. And Adams wasn't a die maker. They made parts for the shoe industry actually, for the machines. And that industry was changing and what they made was disappearing. So they were looking to get into something. They bought his company. And what's really cool, I, I love this guy, is every die maker, and we still do it, stamps their name on the inside of the dies. And what Adams would stamp, J.J. Adams on the inside, he had a stamp made, or he probably made it himself, that said, successor of Am Howe. And he made them, it was in their contract, he had to stamp it on the inside of the die for the next 20 years. That way, probably by the time he was mid-80s, he figured he may or may not be alive. But his entire life, he had dies made with his name on it. And it just blows me away. But anyways, so he was number one. And then up in Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York, die makers sprung up. Now, this is my 100-year-old collection. I've got more. That's all I could fit. Every die here is at least 100 years old. And I've got to deal with all my customers. If you got a really old die, send it to me. I'll make you a new die. Uh, same die, new die, different die, big die, fancy die. I'll give you a set of rotary knives. I don't care. I just want to collect the old dies. I, I love the history in them, and I feel some connection with them. But in the Midwest, the first die maker was Chicago cutting die. It was two Swedish, there's a lot of Swedes that immigrated to Chicago. I'm one of them. And uh, my great, great, or my great, or my grandparents were. Anyways, uh, there's two Swedish blacksmiths that opened Chicago cutting die. And basically every die maker left in the Chicago area can be traced right back to Chicago cutting die. So that's kind of cool. Um, Another thing that's pretty interesting is yeah, I've been doing this for uh, 43 years now, since 1976. And more dies I've passed through my hands than probably the next three people together. That's how many dies we've made, uh, or I've made in my career. But what's interesting is in 79, I think we made the first set of rotary knives where I used to work. And I remember rough milling them on a machine, a bridge port, handing them to the owner and him telling me, Mike, these are going to replace a blacksmith's, you know, a high-speed machine. 
and and they're they've got their place. They, we we make a lot of rotary knives, but what's interesting is 40 years later, it's 40 years now, I've still got three blacksmiths, four blacksmiths pounding away back there, and we make a lot of dies. And the reason is I think because his runs have gone up and some come down faster, faster, shorter runs, and you know everything's on a time crunch. Uh, it makes sense to buy a die cut, you know, three, four hundred dollars, whatever. Get it on a machine real quick. Probably faster than you could schedule an opening on a high production machine. It may take you longer to set the machine up than the die cut the job. So that's that's kind of neat where it's gone full circle. But anyways, if you got any old dies, give me a call. I hope you enjoyed the history. If, you, if there's any corrections, let me know. This is, like I say, just what I've been able to study. And uh, please subscribe. I'm going to do another video on print cylinders, lightweight print cylinders. I got one coming up on bearings, how to take bearings on and off, because we see some people uh, do some funny things with bearings, I think. Um, and if you have any other ideas on videos, give me a holler. Thanks. Please subscribe. Marathon Precision.